amendment have a motion to approve the minutes from our February 5th meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, the minutes are approved. Next, um, City Manager Beston has an update on the Jewish Performing Arts Center. So, Mayor Pro Tem and Council, tonight we have uh, with us uh, Chris Decox, who is the Executive Director of the uh, Jewish Performing Arts Center, along with Leo Gwynn, who is Director of Development. So, I was going to turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We want to first thank Mayor Pro Tem and Council for allowing us to come here tonight. Everything that you've done for us as we've been building. So we wanted to come and thank you in person and then also give you an update on what's happening at the center. So good evening everyone. Uh, so I want to give you a brief construction update. Um, but first of all, thank you for the work that we're doing on South College Street, which is Bill College of Fine Art and the Jewish Performing Arts Center. Uh, we're looking like uh, the middle of March that that street work's going to be done. So we're very excited about that. It's going to help out a lot. Uh, right now, we're about 57% complete construction with the Jewish Performing Arts Center. Uh, you'll start seeing some glass going up on that curtain wall in the next couple of weeks and some site work being done as well. So we are on time and, uh, and ready for completion in August when we open the building. So what everyone is asking about is ticketing and timeline. So I wanted to give you a quick update on what's happening there. So first, we have started blind subscriptions for donors and sponsors. That started January 15th. And we're giving them the option to purchase all 27 shows without knowing what they are. So that's been an interesting journey for us. We're really pleased to announce that we um, have sold 300 subscriptions as of today. So next, we've offered it to faculty and staff and our community partners. Our community partners include Chamber Society or Chamber of Commerce members, and both Opelika and Auburn, Auburn City Schools members, and um, faculty and staff of Auburn University. And then next, we'll open it to the general public. That will be in May when we open to general public. Season announcement is March sixth. That's when Chris finally announces to all of us what shows are coming. He's going to talk a little bit more about programming in a minute. Um, after that, we'll open it back up for don donors and sponsors and community partners to purchase series subscriptions and choose your own. Yes. Um, and then we get to opening festival. Opening festival is August 22nd through the 25th of this year. Hard to believe. We've been talking about it long enough. Opening festival will consist of four days of various performances and events. Thursday evening, we're working with the UPC Council um, at the university to put on a performance for the students. Um, this is the end of Welcome Week, so this will kind of culminate their Welcome Week um, on August 22nd. Friday during the day, we'll offer events, and then Friday evening, because of an anonymous donor, we're able to offer a huge concert outside for the community, and we'll be able to offer $20 tickets to our community members to an artist that's normally $90 or above. Um, this artist is not allowing us to announce on March 6th. We will be able to announce this artist on April the 21st. Then Saturday, we'll have more events during the day, and Saturday evening is our opening gala. That will be a performance and reception for the general public, donors, sponsors, and people who would like to attend. Then Sunday is family day. Um, we'll have performances outside throughout the day. That will be free to our community. We'll have bounce houses and activities for kids. Then Sunday night, thanks to a generous donor, we're able to offer a concert to the construction crew and their family and staff uh, that evening, and then what tickets are remaining we'll be able to offer to the general public. That season announcement, then we'll close for a month, take a break, and inevitably fix all of the things that we notice that aren't quite correct, and then we'll start the season. So Chris is going to share a little bit about the season with y'all. So we will, um, as Leah said, we'll close the building for about four weeks to get some punch list items done. Uh, work on some of the acoustical work that needs to be completed. And on the week of September 23rd, we open back up with our inaugural season. Um, so our inaugural season will have 27 performances across nine different genres. So there are nine uh, different uh, genre seasons and series, and so there are three performances in each. So they range from Broadway series to, uh, to a uh, classical chamber music series to dance to family programming. 
just across the entire spectrum, Americana, so forth. So we're very excited about this. As Leah said, we're announcing this on March the 6th. Um, we have a number of artists that have never come and performed in this area before, some that haven't been here in 20, 30 years, uh, some that uh, have never even performed in Alabama. So this will be a, a big treat for all of our um, all of our residents, not just here in the area, but residents in the state of Alabama as well. And today, quickly to talk about a few partnerships that we're thrilled to, to present to you all, especially um, this week or last week, um, in conjunction with AO Tourism, we have been able to get the Miss Alabama USA, not Miss America, it's Miss USA pageant. They are leaving Montgomery and they'll be coming here with us the week of September 23rd. October 4th. October 4th and 5th, excuse me. Um, so that includes uh, room nights, the rental at the Goose Center, all of those parents and contestants and their loved ones will be here spending money in our community. So this is really what we talked about early days when we presented this first to you all of having things like this come to Auburn and benefit our whole community. Um, our partnership with you has been incredible and we're very thankful for it. And our Tiger Giving Day project, which is this Thursday, is to honor that partnership. And what we are doing is we're raising money to help children in our community go and see shows at the Goose Center. What Chris didn't mention about the season is that we think in the first season we'll have roughly 8,000 school children be able to come to school shows. So the performers who he mentioned aren't just coming to give a performance, they're gonna come and they're gonna do school shows, they're gonna do outreach, and part of our gift to our community to thank them for what they've done for us is to help provide <coughs> buses so that they can come and join us. So we're thrilled about it. It's Thursday, Tiger Giving Day, and you can go online and check it out. But we hope that that just shows our appreciation to our community, and we're thrilled to see those first kids at the show. So we wanted to leave some time for questions, if y'all have any. So Lee and Chris, the shows that are open to the children, is that for all area schools? So we're starting with Auburn City Schools because of our partnership with you all. And then we'll probably go out into Lochapoca and the county schools, and then we'll go into Opelika. We think the number of school shows that we'll be able to offer will be able to reach fairly far. And will you remind us what the capacity seating is here? Go ahead. It's 1,204 seats, and <laughs> it's around 1,200 seats in the Waltos Theater. And then the amphitheater space is about 3,000 to 4,000. Any other questions? My wife and I are looking forward to March 6th. We're coming too. Thank you. We are too. It should be a wonderful evening. And we appreciate you all so much. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you for your support. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions on the agenda for the city manager? Mayor Pro Tem, I do have one item. In front of you are some um, minutes that we had to redo. And so when we get to the regular meeting and you ask for approval of the minutes, we will be asking for approval of the minutes that are in front of you right now. Okay. The items in red are what was changed from the original minutes. This I, I'm sorry, this may be the whole minutes. Oh, you've, already, you've already done. So do we need to go back and, um, and approve other I changes? I think we should just, just for point? procedure because these are the minutes you will be approving. Okay, do we want to take one quick second to review those <coughs> changes? So we will rescind our um, motion and approval of the former minutes and I will ask for a motion to approve the amended minutes that you have before you. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we now have approved the amended minutes for the committee to hold for February 5th, 2019. Um, are there any questions for the city manager? There are none. Do I have a motion to adjourn the committee of the whole? So moved. Second. We are adjourned, and we have a couple more minutes before we start our regular meeting at 7.
restrictions.
Communications, um, as you can probably notice, I'm not Ron Anders. Um, I am sitting here for Ron because he is actually with his family. His wife's mother, um, Patricia Guilford, passed away this week, and her service is tomorrow in Hartford, Alabama. And so I know this council has um, taken the time to wish our deepest sympathies to Ron and Becky and their family. Um, Ms. Guilford was an amazing woman, and Ron is where he needs to be with his family, so our sympathies are with the Anders family this evening and this week. 
Um, we also would like to, um, I would also like to address and um, make a, a brief statement about Friday night's events when we um, saw a great display of our public safety from Auburn as well as our neighboring communities. And um, as you may all be aware, if you're not aware, we had an officer that was injured in the line of duty Friday evening. And his name was Justin, his name is Justin Sanders and he is recovering well at UAB in Birmingham. And I know that this council in various roles have reached out to the family, to the public safety um, force. And I know that we have seen great um, leadership by our chiefs and our public safety departments, fire, um, police, EMS, as well as EAMC, Lee County, and Appalachia. I think it's fitting that tonight we will also honor officers from all those municipalities in just a minute. Um, but at you know, this time, if there's anybody who would like to um, also address that, I know Tommy was at the hospital that evening. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh just like to say how much I appreciate the community support for our police in this community. It's been overwhelming the support and prayers we've received from the citizens and it means so much to us. Uh, this was definitely a, a tragedy that could have been a whole lot worse if not for the grace of God. We give him all the credit and the glory for saving this young man's life. This young man's dad, Jesse Sanders, used to work with us back in the 80s as a volunteer police officer, which means he did this job, did the job, didn't get paid a dime for it. He probably saved me from a few nights from getting skinned up pretty good. Uh, we, we appreciate what he's done for the community. But when I got the, I was listening to the, my scanner, I always, once a police officer, you're always a police officer. And once you hear the sirens running, you got to turn that scanner on and see what's going on, where they're going. And I was listening to it and I found out an officer had been shot and I called the chief and he told me who it was. I immediately went to the hospital and I was doing okay because I walked in the hospital room and saw his mother there in tears, taking it very hard as you can imagine. And it hit home with me because I was talking to his dad about it. And he said, you know, he just left our house. He got this call of the robbery in progress. And we got the, he got the call and left without eating supper with his parents. And they said, give me a call back and when, you, when it's over and let us know you're doing okay. Well, the next call they got was the police uh, chief uh, who called him telling him to go to the hospital because uh, their son had been sh shot and possibly could be serious. And it could have been very serious. They had to stabilize in the East Alabama Medical Center. The doctors out there did a wonderful job. The East Alabama Medical Center staff, I can't say enough good about them. And I also want to talk about our leaders, especially uh, not here in Auburn, but as well across the county, Opelika, Lee County, SO, the state, and everybody, the marshals and everybody came together on this to bring it to a resolution. And uh, it's unfortunate that the suspect uh, chose to go the route he chose to go, but he made that decision, the officers were doing their job. But I want to thank Chief Rester and Chief, uh, the Fire Chief, um, Chief Lankford, I'm getting old. <laughs> but thank Chief Lankford and Chief Rester. The, those firefighters stood out there and fought the fire with rounds exploding inside the apartment, really for just for their own lives, and that means a lot. But uh, we come very close to doing something we've never done in Auburn, that's losing a police <coughs> officer in line of duty. <coughs> Keep that in mind. Sometimes when you want to complain about them or think bad things about them, if not for that thin blue line, folks, you couldn't go to bed at night and rest easy. And I thank God that we have a police force like we have here in Auburn in this county because uh, it means that I can rest at night. My daughter can rest at night. The rest of my family can rest at night because the men and women of law enforcement in this county are keeping us safe. And we're growing by leaps and bounds in this community, and we have a great community, but that would not be possible without the great men and women of law enforcement we have. So tonight I salute you and thank you for risking your lives for all of us, particularly me and my family. And I, it doesn't go unnoticed, and I appreciate what all of you do. Thank you. In the Committee of the Whole, we also um, had a presentation by the Googe Performing Arts Center, and they are progressing along, and they have their, if you, several of you were not here for that presentation, several were, they are having an announcement party for the 27 performances, and so I know the community is very excited to learn what those performances are, and, and we are proud as a city to partner with them and to provide opportunities for our students in this community to also um, have the experience of seeing some performances across the year. We also um, 
have some opportunities for the council to do some communications, but real quick, I want to um, state that I hope everybody went to go vote today so that we can renew our school taxes. It's um, a um, renewal tax, it's not a new tax, and those polls closed at 7, so we'll learn that information later today, but those taxes are vital to the success of our school system, as well as um, we have a lot of opportunities for some things happening this weekend. Empty Bowls is this Saturday evening, as well as a um, cleanup for Parkerson Mill Creek, and those are opportunities to volunteer if anyone is interested in doing that. And then also, if you are around next Saturday, we have a Mardi Gras parade. It'll be the third annual Mardi Gras parade, downtown Auburn, on the 2nd of March at 2 p.m. And um, that, those are the announcements that I have. Any of the other council members have announcements? Yes, yes sir. Um, having a Ward 2 uh, meeting will be on the 26th of February, which is a Tuesday, at 6 p.m. in the Harris Center. We'll have a guest speaker that night from Public Works, our Director Scott Cummings. See, so hope to see you there. All right. I also want to make an announcement: the uh, diversity and inclusion. We're, we're going to have our second meeting March the seventh, and um, hopefully it can be in the <coughs> same room. I hadn't got to see yet. Can you check on that for me, please? I'll check on it. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing it down. <laughs> okay. But it's it, uh, at 5.30. Excellent. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a, a, a public safety in, in this town had a pretty rough week last week, aside from the terrible events around uh, Officer Sanders. We also uh, lost a former uh, deputy Fire Chief Paul Reeves, he passed away last week, and I wanted to uh, recognize the uh, terrific um, participation of uh, Chief Lankford and the AFD uh, crew who uh, made sure that this uh, f former uh, citizen and servant to our city and country, he was also a former um, Vietnam vet, uh, we uh, attended his funeral and uh, provided an escort to the grave and it was uh, wonderfully conducted and, uh, and appropriate for a man of his stature. So thanks to Chief uh, Langford and his staff. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, ward 5 is going to have a ward meeting on March the 4th at 5.30 at uh, East Lake Clubhouse. Great. Okay. Well, at this time, I, it's my pleasure to um, welcome some visitors to our chambers. Um, they're going to give a accommodation, and it's this is Concerned Citizens Organized for Police Support, CCOPS. It's a nonprofit organization established to give support to members of law enforcement as they do their jobs in protecting the lives and safety of our citizens, which we've seen greatly displayed over the weekend. And tonight they'll be honoring law enforcement officers from our community for their hard work and service. So at this time I will come down and ask for Mary Horline and Jack Galassini of CCOPS to come up and make some presentations. quick update about sea cops people ask us why did we start concerned for organized concerned citizens organized for police support and it's the story you just heard about what happened in your own community is the reason why we need to be able to support police and all the work they do our name is concerned citizens organized for police support concern and support are two key words in our name and Basically, we do three things. We try to have interaction between our citizens and the police. We're doing a series of public service announcements to let people know, as you so aptly put out, that every time a police officer puts on that uniform, they're putting their life on the line. They had dinner with their parents. They go out. They don't know what's going to happen. And third, and the reason we're here tonight, is called honoring the best. We're doing honoring the best to honor police officers on a quarterly basis. We've gone in, com in conjunction with the Kiwanis Clubs to be able to do these presentations. 
Luckily in Lee County, we have three Kiwanis Clubs, Auburn, Obelika, and then the Lee County Kiwanis Club. And this evening, the District Governor of Kiwanis, Mary Horlin, will talk about the officers that will be honored this evening. So thank you for having us, and we're here to support law enforcement. Mary. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Kiwanis Clubs of Auburn, Lake County, and Opelika, we're pleased to honor our police officers and deputy sheriff today. The first recipient is Officer Michael Hayden from the Auburn Police Department. President Monica C. Slack from the Auburn Kiwanis Club will present the plaque. And Lieutenant Matt Coffey will make the remarks. Mayor Pro Tem Council, ladies and gentlemen. On January 2nd, 2019, at approximately 11.22 a.m., Officer Michael Hayden responded to First Lube near the intersection of East Glen Avenue and East University Drive in reference to a medical assist. Employees of First Lube discovered the driver of a vehicle they were servicing was unresponsive and did not appear to be breathing. Upon arrival on scene, Officer Hayden observed the 66-year-old female slumped in the driver's seat of the vehicle in the service bay. Officer Hayden confirmed the victim was not breathing and was in medical distress. Officer Hayden removed the victim from the vehicle and began administering solo CPR. A citizen, who was a former paramedic, assisted and provided rescue breathing with an air mask from Officer Hayden's uh, police rescue bag. Officer Hayden continued to perform chest compressions until Auburn fire personnel and paramedics arrived on scene and assumed patient care. Firemen and paramedics administered numerous shocks with AED for transporting the victim to East Alabama Medical Center. Paramedics were able to reestablish a heart rhythm and breathing while en route to the emergency room. Officer Hayden conducted a follow-up with hospital staff later in the day and the victim was still alive and had been admitted into the ICU in critical condition. Due to Officer Hayden's decisive response and application of his police training, the victim was provided critical aid during the age, early stage of her medical crisis until more advanced life-saving measures were available. This afforded her the best opportunity for a favorable outcome. Therefore, it's my pleasure to nominate Officer Michael Hayden for Auburn Police Division's Employee of the Quarter. Our next recipient is Deputy Sheriff Keith O'Shell from the Lake County Sheriff's Department. President Devin Gibson from the Lee County Kiwanis Club will present the plaque and Captain Chris Wallace will make the remarks. Council. I would like to nominate Corporal Keith O'Shell for the Kiwanis Club C-Cops Award. Corporal O'Shell was hired as Lee County Deputy Sheriff on December 6, 2010. He previously served as a patrolman for the Opelika Police Department for approximately three years. Corporal O'Shell is a dedicated deputy sheriff who is fully devoted to carrying out the mission of the Lee County Sheriff's Office. He consistently demonstrates a drive to ferret out crime and to serve the citizens of Lee County, Alabama. He currently serves as a field training officer and as a supervisor in the patrol division. Corporal O'Shell is also gifted with skills and abilities in the area of computers and, te and technology. Corporal O'Shell has taken the initiative to revamp several forms that are commonly used by the deputies, such as warrant templates and DUI and felony case file packets, which help aid in the smooth workflow of the Lee County Sheriff's Office. He also has left a mark in how deputies identify and serve warrants while on patrol. He accomplished this by creating a portal that allows deputies to use their in-car computers to see which warrants are outstanding in certain geographic areas of the county. His innovative work and ideas have helped make all of the deputies more efficient. His work has also been noticed by several other law enforcement agencies in the area who routinely request him to assist them in using technology to become more efficient. 
Corporal O'Shell is a solution finder with a professional demeanor who strives for excellence in all that he does. I am extremely proud of him and count him as an asset to the Lee County Sheriff's Office. I believe he will be an excellent choice for the Kiwanis Club C-Cops Award Program. Our final recipient is Officer Shana Hodges from the Opelika Police Department. President Bob Harris from the Opelika Qantas Club will present the plaque and Lieutenant Ben Blackburn will make the remarks. Council. Officer Shana Hodges has worked with the Opelika Police Department for about four years and she's been a school resource officer for approximately one year. And in that time, she has won the hearts of the students in the Opelika City School System. We've received countless compliments and letters praising her for the work that she does. And Hodges, congratulations. We're super proud to work with you. Thank you for the work you do. And that's why Officer Shana Hodges is our nominee for Officer of the Quarter of the Opelika Police Department. Citizens Police is a thing called Thumbs Up Thursdays. The third Thursday of every month is Thumbs Up Thursday. And billboards that Lamar has, digital billboards in Lee County, you may see a billboard that says Thumbs Up. WSFA on Montgomery, we've been running a series of public service telling you it's Thumbs Up Thursday. If you see a police officer on that day, give them a thumbs up. They're doing a great job. Thank you. Congratulations to all the honorees. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Mary and Jack, thank you very much. And to all the Kiwanis Clubs, Lee County, Auburn, and Opelika, thank you for coming and for honoring our public safety in this manner. All right, we talked a little bit about the community as a whole and we've gone through announcements. Do we have anyone here from Auburn University Communications? Good evening, Council. My name is Taylor Vaughn and I currently serve as the Assistant Director of City Relations and I'm filling in for Caroline Willoughby this evening. On Saturday, February 9th, we hosted the AU Dance Marathon and we raised $502,195 for Children's Miracle Network, which is an organization that works to spread medical awareness as well as raise funds for children's hospitals and increase community awareness for children's health issues. We also have Creed Week coming up in April, um, and we will have a full week focused on the Auburn Creed. Each day focuses on a different line of the Creed, and then at the end of the week, we'll have a tailgate. Um, hopefully on Sanford Lawn um, to help commemorate the Creed. And finally, SGA Senate finished their term last night and um, the new positions were installed last night as well. And they will begin their new term starting next Monday night. And we also have one more announcement from Ms. Caroline Norris and she will be representing the big event. Good evening, Council. My name is Caroline Norris, and I'm the Director of Outreach for the Big Event 2019. Uh, the Big Event is meant for all people in the Auburn community um, because we know that Auburn students make a lot of noise, we make a lot of trash, we make a lot of traffic, um, and the Auburn community supports us in that and protects us, as we've seen today. Um, this year, the Big Event has a website with a new link that's shareable, um, and that is a new way that we're trying to get people to sign up. Um, anyone can be a job site for the big event, so 
your household can be a job site, your church can be a job site, your business can be a job site. Um, this is not need-based. It's to say thank you for all that you do all year. This is one day where we can say thank you back through our service. Um, I have some flyers if anyone has any questions. It has that link on it. It's aub.ie slash the big event. It also has an email, um, a phone number. It has a lot more information on it. So I'm going to leave it by the agendas and anybody who wants one can pick one up. Thank you. Ms. Norris, what's the date of the big event this year? It's March 23rd. That's something I probably should have said before. Okay. Um, yeah, but I hope to see a lot of you there. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. All right, at this time, um, just as a reminder, we'll have Citizens Communications. This is your opportunity to speak for five minutes on anything that's on the agenda. Please note that we do have several public hearings, and so if your comments are better um, served for that time, um, please reserve it for the public hearing. And then if you have something to discuss that's not on the agenda, at the end of our um, regular meeting, we'll have Citizens Communication or Citizens Forum, where you'll have three minutes to speak on anything not on the agenda. So this time I'll open Citizens Communications. All right, we'll see none. Oh, oh okay. You are... <laughs> Got to be quicker, Nick. Just to be clear, if I want to speak about the academic dwelling unit, this is the time? I would hold that to the public hearing. Thank you. Yes, right. thank you. Anyone else? All right, if none, I will close Citizens Communications. And um, City Manager? Under City Manager's communication this evening, we have item 7A is the announcement of one vacancy on the Board of Education. The five-year term begins June 1st, 2019. Ends, March, or ends May 31st, 2024. The appointment will be made at the April 16th, 2019 City Council meeting. Our next item of business this evening is the consent agenda. Does any council member wish to remove any item from the consent agenda and deal with that item individually? I believe we discussed um, a few items. Kelly, do you yeah, want I, to? I think we want to remove um, item 8C1, 2, and 3. Okay. on the consent agenda and the reason for that is simply to give the public an opportunity to see where that expenditure is going and give us a little update in the process on the uh, public safety uh, furnishings. Okay, if there are no objections, we'll um, remove those items. Any other items that would like to be removed from the... You said 8E, right? Um, 8B, I'm sorry, 8C, 8 Charlie, 1, 2, and 3. Any other items to be removed? C7, just to talk on the recycling grant. I'd like to pull that out as well. Okay. Which so one is that? C7, the recycling grant. Recycling partnership, the last item in the consent agenda. Okay. All right. If um, So we will remove <coughs> items 8C1, 2, and 3, and 8, 7. So do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda with those items removed? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Council, I would uh, like to remind you that we do have a um, press release going out tomorrow now that you approve the tax abatement for our call uh, automotive. And if I could, i let uh, Philip Dunlap just give us a brief overview of what they are bringing to our community with this update. Thank you, uh, Jim. <clears throat> our call is a uh, large injection molding operation that's in the West Tech Park. It's an Israeli-based company. Uh, we've had them for several years in the park, and this is a new expansion bringing in additional uh, injection molding machines, larger machines. They make... Uh, it's interesting, they make what we call black parts. And you wonder what is a black part in a car. It's the things you never see. You open up the hood, it'll have a liner in the hood or the trunk or back under the dashboard. So these are normally larger parts and, and some of them are very sophisticated. So it's actually a very, very interesting company. Uh, actually pretty high tech to do the stuff that they do. So 
We're very pleased that we're investing another 2.3 million to add another 25 jobs. But again, it continually reflects uh, the type of companies we recruited value added, technology based. So we're very excited about their expansion. It reaffirms their commitment to all of them. And by the way, their customers are people like Mercedes Benz, BMW, BMW, BMW others of that nature. So it's, uh, it's really an outstanding little company. Okay, thank you, Philip, and thank you for your team's effort on that. Item HC1 is a contract in the amount of $349,237.68 with Alabama contract sales to purchase furniture for the new public safety complex. Do you have a motion? <laughs> well, um, can you put some more meat on that bone here? Tell, tell folks what it is we're buying with that money. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry? But tell us the, uh, what that contract covers, please. Okay. I'll give you a general overview, and then yes. I'll let uh, Bill James give you some specifics. So this is a large complex that is uh, housing uh, not only this chamber, uh, the, the uh, council chamber, it is housing a court chamber, it is housing police, fire, and our communications uh, group. So there's a lot of furniture uh, required, a lot of specialized furniture required as well. So I'm going to let uh, our uh, public safety ma uh, department head, Bill James, give you a more detailed analysis of that. Bill, you might want to come up here so we can actually hear it on the... And I, I'd suggest that you cover items one, two, and three all same time here. Oh, I will. Okay. Thank you. Yes, all three of these uh, contracts are with various vendors that will be providing different furniture for different parts of the building. Uh, this includes desks. It includes chairs, uh, not only for desk, task chairs, uh, dais chairs for the council, uh, seating for the new council chambers, uh, wood benches for the new courtroom, uh, lockers for the men's and women's locker rooms, uh, dining table and fire with chairs, um, 911 uh, console equipment uh, for the new 911 center. In the entryway of the uh, north side of the building, there'll be seating for the public as they're waiting on either going to court or they're going over to the uh, city council. Uh, it's got um, uh, conference tables and chairs, uh, just uh, pretty much across the board what you would see in a office setting uh, is all three of these packages include some form of uh, furniture that is uh, being purchased through um, probably 15 different vendors. And these are budgeted our items currently? Yes, they were part of the original uh, contract that we came to council with, yes. Well, one of the things we are doing with this building that we have not done previously is when we presented to the council the cost of the building, we included all of this information, not just the building costs, but all of the outfitting of the building, all of the technology, everything that <clears throat> we could think of that would be a cost, including a potential overrun. Great. Thank you. Any further questions for Mr. And I'd like to just say this. Uh, for those of you that don't know Bill James, I had to work for him for a number of years, and he wouldn't spend a dime without it being accounted for him. <laughs> so for him to approve it, you trust me, you're getting your money's worth, because Bill is uh, very tight with the city's money. <laughs> Thank you, Chief, I think. <laughs> we do it a long time. It's a compliment. And, and Jim, all of these items are, they're published. I mean, somebody can see these on, the public can go and see these items online, right? If they look at the packet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes, and these were all purchased off either state contract or purchasing cooperatives. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so do we have a motion for 8C1? Move for approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Item HC2 is a contract in the amount of $356,745.11 with business interiors to purchase furniture for the new public safety complex. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Item HC3 is a contract in the amount of $314,991.72 with interior elements to purchase furniture for the new public safety complex. Move for approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Item HC7 is a resolution authorizing uh, an agreement with the recycling partnership of, uh, to grant, for grant funds totaling $175,200 to be used uh, for recycling. And Jim, will you talk a little bit about what this grant, we've had several grants um, for our recycling right. program? I will let Tim Woody uh, talk to you about that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Good evening. Um, as you guys may know, uh, we received a couple of grants in the past uh, from Alabama Department of Environmental Management, $288,000, $350,000, and this grant here for $175,200. The other two grants were for purchasing the single stream carts. This one here will be for purchasing 2,000 more single stream carts, but just as importantly also for public education outreach. And this organization specializes in that. In addition to the $175,200 in cash, they're also donating $150,000 in in-kind services. They're going to utilize their graphic design team and their staff to do a lot of the work for us. There's going to be some digital communications involved. There's going to be some postcards, things of that nature. Uh, Coca-Cola is the major funding partner here, but you have PepsiCo, you have Waste Management, you even have Heineken, mm -hmm. you have Amazon. Those companies are the ones that are giving money for this, so we're really excited about that. Um, Another aspect of it is making sure that citizens recycle the right things because that's very important in single stream. So we're, we're looking forward to it. And is it to remind us to break our boxes down and... Yeah, not you know. put glass in your single stream cart, things of that nature. How many carts are out right now? Uh, 12,600. We have, we have right at 100 carts left. <laughs> so I'm hoping you guys will approve this tonight so we can go ahead and order some. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any further questions for Mr. Woody? I'd just like to say thank you for pursuing these grants, uh, you and your staff. This is a great thing. You spend other people's money. I like that. Yeah, right at $800,000, that's, that's a lot. That's thank impressive. You thank you. Thank you. All right, so do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Under ordinances this evening, we have item 9A1 is a request for approval of amendments to the Auburn Zoning Ordinance for purposes of creating a new housing type to be, to be named Academic Detached Dwelling Unit. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this item and a public hearing is required. At this time, I'll open the public hearing. If anybody would like to come forward and speak to this item, please do so at this time. Apparently, I'm the only one who wants to speak about it. Uh, Nick Hayes, 333 Brookside. Uh, been in communication with uh, most of you now, and um, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, I do not approve of this ordinance or think it's good policy. Um, I think uh, generally taking away a property owner's rights for their property is a bad idea. Um, taking power from an individual property owner and putting it in the hands of whether it's the federal government or Auburn City government and the planning department is a bad idea. Um, where this ordinance falls short is in a number of areas, but with, with regard to the Canton area, which I think is the area which has brought on a lot of this, um, and, and, and that area has certain dynamics that I think are unique and to it and not to other areas of the city like RDD and urban neighborhood zonings and dealing with it surgically I think would be a much better idea than dealing with it as sort of a citywide issue when it's I don't believe it's a citywide issue as much as it's specific to certain areas or neighborhoods and in regards to that area, we're out, we're sort of doing away with academic dwelling units, but we're not doing away with the occupancy requirements. And so five unrelated are still allowed in that area. And so the idea that we're not gonna 
build five bedroom, five bath houses, but you can build a five three or a three two and three students can live in it or five students can live in it. And the idea that the folks who currently are affected over there are all of a sudden gonna be happy with it because that house, which is still occupied by students, has two less bathrooms than it did before, I don't think that's uh, accurate or, or meaningful. Um, the idea that floor plans are gonna be critiqued in the way they are is something totally new to the planning department and that, I think that was misrepresented in the uh, comments to you all Friday in the packet meeting. Not that the staff isn't reviewing the floor plans, but the timing in which floor plans now have to be completed as opposed to before is something that's totally different. Before, in a conditional setting, you would, you would approve a site plan and a use through staff and planning commission and then the city council and then you'd start your floor plan and your kind of detailed design after that because you're not going to spend all the money required to do your floor plan until you know it's going to be approved. Before, when it's permitted by right, you might have that floor plan done earlier because you know it's going to be allowed. It's permitted by right. It's your right to build that. And now they want to take that away uh, for reasons that you know I, do, I don't personally agree with. Um, I, I think that what would be a better idea is to look at the Corradino area on its own look at the dynamics over there, uh, how people are affected, what is appropriate over there, and what may not be. Same with the Canton area, and then same with the rest of RDD and urban neighborhood. And not just treat it as though it's kind of a one-size-fits-all model and applying the same set of standards in all these areas when the it, it, each area has its own unique set of circumstances and, and who lives there. So, thank you. Member B. Jackson, as it pertains to the Northwest sector in Auburn. Mr. Promotion. Jackson, could we get your address, please, for the yes, record? 814 North College. Thank you. As it pertains to the Northwest end of Auburn, which I have been very concerned with, with this type of housing, I don't think it, I think it's a little bit too little too late because of the fact right now, the people in Northwest Auburn, when the Northwest Auburn plan was, was being put together, they were excluded. Uh, they were not involved. The definitions came later. We looked at drawings, we looked at prints, we were promised things that, that were never ever delivered. So if you start talking about this type of housing now, the people are, have become so disgruntled when they come to the Planning Commission meeting, they say, oh, shucks, they don't hear us. They ain't going to listen to us. And far as promised, and I will stand on this, at a meeting at Boykin, that we would have smaller meetings, that definitions would be spelled out real plain, real clear. Now we're at the Cadino property. There's nothing, like the gentleman said, that will prohibit student housing from being, I mean, students from living in a, in a dwelling there. And if it's four or five bedrooms, three, four baths, so what? We had the neighborhood conservation maps drawn to say that that area, the 18 acres, the largest track of RDD property that was left in Northwest Auburn was preserved as a neighborhood conservation area. Now what we're facing, we're facing an 18 acre development that's possibly sitting on an old dump. And the people are very upset, they're very disgruntled with the previous council, they're very disgruntled with the planning department because if that was preserved for neighborhood conservation, why are we now still looking at an RDD zone? Why wasn't it included? Why wasn't the people informed that this was gonna happen? Why didn't this happen at the time that Northwest Auburn plan was being put in motion. I'm just, uh, I'm disappointed and the people are disappointed. We have very little hope that our planning office, even though they received an award, had the people's best interests at heart. 
and especially now that the Cadino property is being considered for RDD, use permitted, it's being considered for single family housing, what is to say that five unrelated can't show up and live there? So we, this is not going to fix our problems. We're concerned with our voting strength. We're concerned with our representation in different offices at the city. So what this has done for us is, is hardly anything. So whoever purchases that property, they, the people in the community are going to be at the mercy of the Planning Commission. And who's to say they cannot place five unrelated people there? I don't think it's a great idea. Thank you. Um, my name's Chris Birdsong, 814 Antelope. Um, and and uh, I'd like to uh, agree with Nick and Mr. Jackson. Um, uh, a couple of things that I that I see a problem with on on the ADDU is uh, we've met a couple of times and 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 talked about how we can solve the problem and it was my understanding that the the problem all rested on off the street parking um, uh, being able to park cars um, in the back of a property off the street so uh, fire trucks and city trucks could get up and down the road and we went over that we all agreed that we would park our vehicles off the street, or our tenants' cars off the street, and then at the at a planning meeting, um, it was at the very end. It was says it was mentioned to uh, make it 1.1 cars per tenant, which is six six vehicles. And um, on some of our property, that'll prohibit any any redevelopment at all. Um, another problem that I have with the ADDU is there is absolutely no definition. Nobody can tell me what's allowed and what's not allowed. It's just under review and if it's deemed to be student housing, um, it's stamped and then we have to go in front of the planning and we have to go in front of the city council. And as, uh, as uh, an investor, I don't know of anyone that would buy property um, in RDD um, and have to get plans done going with a conditional use there's absolutely i think it's going to absolutely stop anything on redevelopment and there's plenty of homes in in northern auburn that um that need redeveloped and it will not happen if this passes Mayor Pro Tem, ladies and gentlemen of the council, Herbert Walter DeMar Jr. I live at 412 Opelika Road, apartment 111, in an apartment complex which is occupied by some students, not all. And I had spent a number of years living in another apartment complex with all student housing was there. And I um, don't live in the areas directly affected by the uh, Gentlemen, the previous three speakers spoke about, but I had a chance to attend the last Ward 1 meeting that Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Fitch Taylor uh, sponsored, and we, I thank her for that. And I'm sorry I had attended the Ward 4 meetings with Mr. Smith, but I'll make one one day. But this is to say that based on what I heard, their concerns is about affordable housing in that area and what's going to happen to the um, what the public housing that Mrs. Tolbert talked about in the Ward 1 meeting. I would hope that you all would take that into consideration tonight along with this ordinance because the, the, obviously the future of these areas, particularly Northwest Auburn, is at stake here with this and I'm sure the people of Northwest Auburn would rather see affordable housing or what's going to happen to the public housing that's there now than the student housing. And I also say this as a student at three schools, I feel for the students and I love them and I'm glad that we're in a town like this. But the people of Northwest Auburn has expressed their concerns and I would just hope that you would at least with your decisions tonight say that you are concerned about what they want. Thank you. Thank you. 
Is there anyone else that would like to speak at the public hearing? My name is Travis Wisdom. I live at 1474 Turn Lake Drive. <clears throat> I own um, properties at 104 La Costa, 106 La Costa, 112 La Costa, 114 La Costa, an apartment complex at 835 North Gay. All of these properties are RDD zoned currently. And I'm not anywhere near uh, Canton or the Cordino property. I know where that is. Um, but this change would affect RDD zoning for everybody who's in RDD zoning. And I guess I really just wanted to know if any of you can tell me why I have to suffer a down zoning to fix a perceived problem in the Canton area. North Gay and its residents have actually nominated me for the Auburn Beautification Award. Probably don't deserve it, but they like what I'm doing and <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand why the fix for whatever's going on in Miss Fitch Taylor's district has to affect what's happening where I am. Um, so whoever wants to address that. Well, I appreciate what you've done on North Gay. I've seen your properties and it's very nice and it's cleaned up an undesirable area. So thank you for that. Um, I can't answer your question because I too am confused by the the method behind the ordinance. So maybe when we have a discussion, we have an opportunity to ask um, city manager some questions. Okay. We can address that. I mean, I just I would urge you, please don't down zone my property and, and hurt my property rights. I mean, I'm not saying there's not a problem somewhere else, but it seems like this fix is not going to be the solution for that problem. Uh, but it's certainly, there's no problem where we are. We're kind of happy and I don't really want to be affected because somebody else perceives they have a problem. Of any sort. Well, it's not a zoning. Ma'am? It's not a zoning. A, a down zoning. It, it is not a down zoning. It is not a zoning at all. It is right, the creation right. of, a, a, of a new zoning. use type and a new way to regulate um, that use type. Does it take away something I can do by right now? Well, it, okay. to, the extent, to the extent that these are now regulated as single-family homes, which they're absolutely not, sure. But that's, the, that's one of the problems that this ordinance attempts to address. But with all due respect, um, the first three speakers, all of those comments were absolutely riddled with misunderstanding and inaccuracy. And so if we need to have more sessions to educate folks on what's going on here, we're glad to do that, but um, extraordinarily off base and just misunderstandings of and basically the entire proposal. Thank you. Whether it's a down zoning or not, I don't want to have a property right stripped from me in an area that doesn't seem to be affected by whatever it is someone's trying to cure. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. How are y'all? Good, how are you? Good, good. Um, my name's Ken Pilant. Um, I'm from Auburn. Um, grew up actually across the street from, from this fine gentleman, uh, Chief Dawson, at two, uh, let me see, what's my mom's address? 2010 Cox Road? I think you're right. Um, Is that your be. address? Will, you, be anyway. will you share your address with us, please? Uh, technically, I, f I finally grew up and now I'm residing at 1400 Antelope. Okay. I'm pretty proud of myself. <laughs> Um, but but it's kind of ironic. I'm kind of glad I, I brought that up and uh, get an opportunity to say hey to Tommy. Um, it, you know, I sit back and listen, and, and uh, it, I, I'm a I'm a small developer, I guess you could say. Um, my, my wife and I founded a company that um, is uh, we we specialize. Well, we started specializing in in rehabbing homes. Um, we started on East Magnolia um, and did five homes in, in that area. Um, we're currently working on a project uh, on, on Antelope 
uh, we purchased seven acres that was that was CDD um, property and, and are currently now um, in the process of subdividing it. Uh, Brett, I think it's maybe in, in your district, perhaps. Um, and and you, you know, doing some infill activities, and and um, you know. I'm also a part of a project on Canton Avenue. Um, we are uh, a group of us acquired three uh, fee simple lots, lots of, of records um, that were existing, um, and and or two of them um, were not habitable at all. I think one of them. Um, didn't even have a floor system in it. Um, I think we, what we did evict out of there was raccoons and feral cats. Um, and and the reason why I'm kind of, you know, bringing this up is, is, um, you know, there, I think there there are issues. Um, we 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 do have problems. Um, I think that's a constant struggle in in any type of relationship is how we. How we get past those, um, but I think we also need to be f very careful and, and very fair on how we paint the pictures that we try to present to each other. Uh, and the project specifically that I'm working on, we we tore down three houses. I've lost four houses in over five years, only four. Three of which were on Canton Avenue. Two of the three properties were not habitable and were safety hazard. So I'm not exactly sure how that negatively impacted the community as a whole, as, as a city of Auburn, but then also very specifically to Canton Avenue, Frazier, White Street, um, Williams Avenue, and I think Grant, you know, that, that area. Um, there were safety and hazard concerns. That's what they were. The third property housed a uh, low to middle income uh, family. Um, it, it was a rental property and had been for decades. Uh, we worked diligently to try and, and, and relocate uh, that family, uh, which, which we did. We found her another rental property um, in, in the same school district. Um, the gentleman I'm looking over there happens to be my project manager and uh, ironically enough he was he was uh, the original property owner. So we, we let this family stay in there, found another house, acquired it through our network of investors, moved this family into this house in the same school district, not just city of school, not just Auburn city of schools, but in the same school district. So of these three specific properties on Canton Avenue, I can't understand how I'm supposed to feel bad about that. How that that's not a good thing. How that how that anybody is supposed to throw mud in my face or my team's face or my investor's face. That that this is a bad thing. And the reason why I bring all this up is is that you know this ADDU thing. <coughs> these these properties in which that we are constructing could perhaps be labeled as an ADDU. This Canton Avenue, when the, when the investor first purchased these properties, was RDD. Subsequently, now it's NRD. In an NRD zone, ADUs are not even conditional. Not so they're not, they're not even permitted, but they're not even conditional. So th this investor, or these investors, I see a couple of them in this room, they're putting millions of dollars into our community, into properties, some of which were hazardous and safety concerns. They're, they're pumping in all this money, and if their properties burn down, what happens? Now to this new ordinance, this new zoning, they can't reconstruct them. That's a, that's a, that's a tremendous loss. It's a tremendous loss. Um, there, there is a problem, however, and I know the planning department, the planning commission, 
everybody in this room somehow, some way, some form, some fashion has contributed. Um, but I, I don't think our work is over. I think we need to talk some more. I, th I think we need to be perhaps more realistic at times. There is a problem. But let me give you, let me give you a recent statistic in specific relations to Canton Avenue. So I'm building three properties that are addressed. At the current moment in time, I took count today, and I could be off plus minus one. I believe there are 18 properties on Canton Avenue. Of those 18 properties, does anybody want to take a guess who are owner occupants? Zero. It's like two at the at the most. Of those two, there's there's four that are currently existing properties prior to the new development. Four properties. One is vacant and uninhabitable. One is an investment property that I believe is an alleged duplex. One, there's a house in an adjacent vacant lot that, that was put up on the MLS for $344,000 that they're actively trying to sell and capitalize on this new growth and redevelopment, which, by the way, that's what RDD stands for. That's what it's supposed to spawn. It's supposed to spawn redevelopment district. The name is self-implied. And then the last one is, as I believe, an, an owner occupant, perhaps, of 18. 16 of 18 addressable structures are investment owned. What? Who's, who here owns property on, Can, on specifically Canton Avenue that's being misrepresented here? simple question. Um, one last thing that I'd like to bring up in regards to Cox Road, and I happen to know Chief Dawson also lives out there. When my parents were so fortunate enough to be able and have the means to purchase the property out there on Cox Road, they had a sneaking intuition in which that um, there was going to be exit 50 sooner or later. Now, with that change, we've had some hiccups and uh, some things. Um, you know, some changes. But with also change, sometimes it can help us realize that, you know, what, what it is, the reason why we do buy and own property and material things. There's some that are tangible that we use up and consume and throw away, and then there's other that we buy as investments. Real property is one of those things. We buy, we hold, and we sell in order to make money, unless it's something that unfortunate circumstances cause us to lose said properties. So if people want to sell their properties like they have every right to do, then they, they should be able to do it and we shouldn't stand in their way. And if in fact in which that there is some undue influence or something that's unethical or immoral or, or heaven forbid actually illegal, when they get to the closing table at an attorney's office, it's, it's the job of said closing attorney to inform them, do you understand what's going on here? Those are the things that take place in a real estate closing. So there are already, you know, measures for people not, you know, for people not to get taken advantage of. Um, but anyway, I just, I, I don't, I think there's an issue. We need to work on it. There's been a lot of work already done, but we're not there yet, in my opinion. And I hope that everybody, have you guys think about it. It's a big decision, and um, hopefully we can get there. Thank you for your time, and thanks for your patience with me. I get long-winded. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Tom. I, I, can I say something? Uh, you can, but we can close the public hearing and then we can talk. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in the public hearing? Yes. Good evening. Uh, Felix Legassi, 2611 Wilmington Court. Um, I guess I'm one of the investors that, that uh, invested in Canton, which is, I guess, a bad thing, but <laughs> I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Because when I first purchased over there, probably four years ago, there was condemned houses, run-down properties, 
vegetation everywhere. And I said, well, this was, this was zoned a certain way that was five unrelated people could live in a home. So it was an opportunity for me to come in there and clean up the area. And that's what I thought I was doing. And basically, we started building these houses. And I have 14 homes over there I've built. I know Chris is building six. I know we got Don Allen's building another. Or Chris is building three. Got Don, Don Allen's building six. So that's 23 homes that I know are brand new in that area. And that can't be more than seven homes that are sitting there that people actually live in. And I know there's rentals over there. There's probably as many rentals as people that are living there prior to even me being there. Um, the problem I have with the ADU is um, basically what we've done over there is considering, I guess it's ADU now. This is what Forrest saying that is, right, Forrest? Well, it's not until we say it is and we don't have that in place yet. But if, it, if, it, if the regulations were in place, that's what they would be for sure. Okay. So that's ADU, so which is five unrelated, okay? Which is RDD is what, five unrelated? <laughs> Um, so what's going to happen is basically what they're going to do is they're going to build, instead of building five bedrooms, five baths, they're going to build four bedrooms, three and a half baths. So you're going to lose one, you know, and you might have four bedrooms, three and a half baths, and then have a study. But you're there's still going uh, to have five kids in the house. That's one of many misunderstandings that I've heard tonight, and that is... Nowhere in the definition does it say an ADDU is exclusively a five bedroom, five bath, so that if you change it to a five bed, four bath, it's no longer an ADDU. That is one of probably at least 30 inaccuracies that are just entirely misunderstandings of the regulations. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really, RDD is what I'm trying to figure out. Is RDD is five unrelated. Is that correct? That, that is actually correct. Okay. So what I'm saying is with five, and my question is, if you do RDD and you go five unrelated, we don't have any specs on what that is. What are we going to do? What, how, how does this need? It can't be five bedrooms, five bath, because that's going to be considered ADU. Is that not correct? Possibly. Possibly. See, here we are. I'm in a gray area, and I don't understand it. We, we, so what I'd like to know is if you're going to put it in, if you're going to say, okay, RDD, you can do five related. Okay, so now we're going to basically say you can do it, and it's going to look like a single-family home, I assume which I think everything over there looks like a single family home. The inside might not look like a single family home, but what is, the in, what is a single family home on the inside? Is that four bedroom, three and a half baths? Is that a bigger common area? Is that a half bath downstairs? I don't know. And the only one that knows that answer is Forrest. He's the only one that's gonna prove this because no one else knows, seems to know. Everybody, so we're gonna, I'm gonna get my plans, I'm gonna take it to Forrest and he's gonna say, no, nah, that's not right. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to change this, we need to change that, we need to change it. And I just want to be clear before I even go about getting an architect involved, designing a set of plans, and then submitting it. Because when I was submitting I want to know what's right. Instead of spending all the money, wasting all my time, and wasting his time as well, saying it's not right, it's not acceptable. You know? I, I will just say one thing, and this has been stated in your staff report that's in your packet. It was presented multiple times on Friday at the at the ADDU meeting, and I know I've said I know I've said this to at least some of the folks who came up here and spoke tonight. <laughs> this is being made overly complicated on purpose when it's not. This is no different than the private dormitory regulations that were adopted nearly three years. It'll be three years ago next month. Those regulations have been implemented seamlessly. There have been no difficulties. The methodology that's employed, the criteria that we use, the things we look at are exactly the same. And there has not been any problems in three years with the private dorm. The only difference is these are single units on single lots of record. Private dorms are multiple units, typically on a single lot of record. I'm, I'm really not oversimplifying this. But what's being, what's being represented is, is misunderstanding and overcomplication of something that's actually quite simple. And I'm not the only one that understands it. My entire staff understands it. The Planning Commission understands it because they recommended approval unanimously of it. And, and I think the council has at least a better understanding after the session we had on Friday. Well, the investors uh, and developers don't understand it. Because that's what I'm hearing. And I don't understand it. I really don't. 
I mean, I would like to know RDD, what that is considered. What's the difference between RDD and academic dwelling units? What's the difference? RDD is a zone, an academic detached five, dwelling unit. I'm talking units. about five unrelated kids or five unrelated adults, whatever. Five unrelated. One is a one is a occupancy regulation. The other is a housing type. This is a housing type. Okay, so a housing type in basically saying that RDD, what we have over there in Canton, is a, is a, is that a housing type? Is that what is that? The housing type's what you built on the property. That's a housing type. The zone is what the property is zoned and regulated by. So basically, what we're doing there now is it not, is not basically basically to say you can't do that anymore. Is that what you're? Is that what basically what's happening in the R, because it's RDD? The, R, the area that you're talking about has largely been rezoned to NRD. So the RDD is five unrelated, right? It's still five unrelated. That's right. The purpose and intent of the NRD is, is different because a lot of what we were hearing through the Northwest Auburn plan process was the desire to maintain the integrity of some of these neighborhoods. Now, what I think I'm hearing a lot of people say tonight is that neighborhood's already gone, so why do we even bother with it? And if that's a discussion we need to have and a decision point that needs to be made, but the, the underlying premise of this regulation is good. It will put us in a better position if it's in place than it, than it will if we if we don't use it. Um, I'm, I'm fine with that if it's better. I just don't quite understand it. And I don't think the investors that I hear understand it as well. Maybe they do understand it, but I don't think so. But I, don't, I still don't understand it. Forrest got it, and maybe his, his planning could be, but I, we don't get it. And we'd love to get it. And all I'm asking you to do is, before you make a decision, consider tabling it till we can all understand it. And I'm good either way, but I'd like to understand what where I'm going to move forward in, in, in if I'm going to proceed building in the Auburn area. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. Anyone else before we close the public hearing? All right, I'll close the public hearing. <coughs> Does anyone have um, any issues or concerns with moving forward with this ordinance this evening? Well, I before we move forward with it, I would like to say something because I like to address some of the concerns or the comments that were made. Well, and 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 I hear that you saying, and especially on Canton, and I most people in here know that I live well the next street over from Canton. And that's on Wood Street. Yes, the damage has been done on Canton Street, but that that does not kill the neighborhood. Okay. We still have people that live in that neighborhood who's concerned uh, about what's going up. Every time a developer buy a, um, a home from someone, they'll continue to build student housing. Well, to me, uh, no one is really considering the people that's already, that's still there. And I happen to be one of the people that's still there. Uh, there was a comment made, and I can't remember which which one one of the people said it, but and uh, something about uh, William Street. The, somebody bought somebody out on William Street, or one of the homes. I think it was this gentleman right here was saying the truth. Yep, bought a house on William Street or something. I know, I know Mr. Dell Brooks just sold his home on William Street. Yeah, Dale sold his house. I, I, I understand. Okay, so you bought a house on William Street. Okay, and I don't know what happened in the past, the reason why all this came about, because I wasn't on the council. Okay, but I do see now what actually, what it has affected now. Um... It's sad that we, ha we we are in a position that we're in now because of something that did not, was not covered in the past. Um, it saddens me to know that I, even on Canton, m myself, my neighbor, Mr. Brooke that sold, the property that's directly behind us, we went to the person that owns that property. I know I did. 
Right. And, and Mr. Brooks said he did too. He would not sell that property to us. I would have liked to extend my property on back onto Canton. So we could not get these people to say, I don't know if they knew what was coming forward. The guy knew what was coming forward. The reason why he would not sell the property. I just, you know, I don't even know why it got to be at the point that it is at now. And yes, that damage has been done on Ken. There's maybe one, two occupied homes on Ken Street. And there's two properties there, and I think belongs to Mr. Jackson. That's not occupied, and I don't know what Mr. Jackson's intent is with his property, but I do know that other two owners on that property do not want to sell. And it's sort of sad that someone would come in and say, okay, let's, let's rezone this, and we'll, and it was a neighborhood, and it's been a neighborhood. And it was, I guess at one point it was, all, all of it was zone NC. So somebody changed it on down the line. So that gave somebody the opportunity to come in and they build these these houses. But I also heard someone in a previous council meeting say that it may be lawful to do some things, but um, is it right? Because I, I, I just think that there could have been another way, and that was the lapidated houses in the area, but I think that that, that neighborhood could have been uh, saved if you if somebody had came in and maybe built some houses for families. I mean, this is family neighborhood. Well, it was. So, you know, we we, we arguing about. I guess we not really arguing, but debating about a situation that I guess at this point this council really don't have any control of when it comes to to, to Canton Avenue because that damage has already been done by previous whoever. I'd love to save William Street. Yes, there are students that live on William Street, but there's different type of housing that was put up. They were family housing. Um, and students occupy two of them. The problem I have mainly with Canton Street and these, these houses coming up, it's affecting, our, it's affecting the neighborhood as far as parking. I don't even see how you, right directly behind me, there have been six of them built. I don't even see how uh, in each one I'm supposed to occupy five, six cars. You tell me a street at that length, that's 30 cars plus visitors and all of this, that, that um, the people that are living there, you put up these student housing, and I have no problem with students, don't get me wrong, but you put, up, put them up in a neighborhood, Amen. and um, it's, it's like nobody's considering the people that was already there. Why couldn't you have built single family homes? I know what it's zoned for. I understand that. If you, if you felt like the, the houses were dilapidated, couldn't you build something to accommodate the neighborhoods? It's too late. Yeah, it's too late. But is it really got to continue? Throughout Auburn, I mean, so on the northwest side, does it really has to continue on our side? We can't even argue about Canton anymore. Hopefully the rest, the neighbor says there. I hope the rest of them do not see them. But at this point, I don't even see why. They, you know, even myself, that if if we keep being pushed out the neighborhood, then I'm gonna have to say it. <coughs> and whatever gentleman relocated those people to somewhere else, I hope y'all able to relocate me. Okay. So the question before us is, um, and thank you, Connie, for those comments. It, is there any objection to moving forward with this item this evening? I don't think we're ready at all. I, I think that there's no way are we ready to make a decision on this. Um, I don't know. I see my job as a city council member, as a representative of this city, is to take care of the, the members of our city 
And when we've got a small slice of our city that's occupied primarily by African American people, uh, I think our intentionality for a vision of this city incorporates taking care of the people who are the most underrepresented, uh, underrepresented, underrepresented in our city. And um, I respect a developer to, who, who was out there trying to make a living in, in the manner that, that they're skilled to do so. There's room for that. There should be room in this city for that. But I don't think there's room in... I, I believe we need to get a backbone and represent the, uh, the most underserved in our community. It's, it's, it's terrible. I, I, you can sit here and you can say, you can sit here and you can say, yeah, what have we, what have we done on Canton that's so bad? I would, I would argue that the intentionality of city, city fathers and mothers is to take care of, create a vision whereby we take care of all of our citizens and, and, and the intentionality, I believe, in the planning department back in the day was to redevelop that, that area, but not necessarily for student housing. So I'm not ready to move forward on this at all. I think, I think we need to speak with the developers. I think we need to find common ground where we can all walk away feeling like we've been heard, we're taking care of the people who live here, and we're taking care of uh, the economic prosperity at the same time. I think there's plenty of ground to find, and I'm not sure that we can find that right now. So um, do I hear, so... Mayor Pro Tem, yes. we, we would want someone to introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent, and then if someone wanted to de deny unanimous consent, they could do it at that time. So do I have a motion to introduce the ordinance? Well, let me just first, let me just say, I appreciate Mr. Parsons' comments, but at the same time, I don't feel like anybody in this city is being unrepresented. I feel like Ms. Taylor does a good representation of her folks, and, and uh, I try to represent mine. And I don't think anybody's been represent, misrepresented because of the color of their skin. I just don't see it. Uh, I think if you own a piece of property, where it be on Canton or where it be on Cox Road, you got a right to sell it if you want to. If they come along with enough money and you want to sell it, you got a right to sell it. Uh, the investors got a right to buy it and, and develop it if he likes to. And uh, if you don't want to sell it, you got a right to stay there without selling it. But I just, for the life of me, and this is America, I think you got a right to sell your property if you want to, and you got a right to buy it if you want to. And I'm off taking care of everybody, but uh, at the same time, you can't you can't tell a person you can't sell your property. I mean, you got people in certain areas that may be on a piece of property for a hundred years, and if they happen to be this, if this generation happens to be this generation that gets a chance to make money off of it, I'm all for it. Mr. Jackson, you made money off your family property on North Gay Street, didn't you? I did. All right then. So. Uh, <laughs> It was uh, basically vacant property around it. It was open for development. I don't fault you for the selling. But what I'm saying is, I did not disrupt an entire neighborhood. And if, and if I may, can, let's keep the comments to the dais and um, amongst ourselves since we're we're discussing an ordinance. If, if we could do that. Well, I, I, he he expressed his feelings. I got a right to express mine. Yeah. But and my feelings are: if you got a right to develop your property in Auburn, if you want to, and you got a right to not sell it, and either way. Absolutely. Well, I don't really think, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say this, and I know I was long-winded, but I, I'm not, I don't have a problem with people selling their property if they want to, but I just, I just want that whoever buy the property be considerate of the neighborhood and what's already in the neighborhood. I have no problem with people selling their property. So I don't want, uh, you know, I don't even want these developers to think, hey, hey, I'm mad with y'all because y'all bought these people property. Yeah, they sold their property, you bought the property, but at least be considerate of what's already there in the neighborhood is all I'm saying. Saying. Okay. Do I have a motion to introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent? I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. Does anyone have any issue with moving forward with this agenda item this evening? I do. I'd like to deny unanimous consent. Okay. Then we will hear this um, on <coughs> March the 5th. And item number uh, 9A2 is a request for before we move on, okay, we've denied unanimous consent. We're going to hear this again in two weeks. But unless we have some meetings and some whatnot in the next two weeks, we're going to be right back in the same spot. Right. So I would hope that, that uh, we could arrange some meetings with uh, interested parties 
uh, and come to the table with some suggestions uh, again to, to how, how we're going to work this out, how we can accommodate uh, some, if not all, interests. So let's please commit to a, a further discussion between now and the next council meeting. We, we can we can do that. Two weeks may not be enough time, but what we can do is put it on, have it up for the agenda in two weeks. If we don't have everything resolved in two weeks, we can then table it to a date certain after that. But two weeks may be a short time to get all this ironed out. Well, I know I was one of the ones that pushed y'all early when, when we first had our new council to, to get on with this. And it was based on the concerns that I felt neighborhoods were being affected. And I um, understand by, by us denying unanimous consent, we're pushing the can a little further down the road and giving even more opportunities for other permits or whatnot to be granted in the, in the interim. But um, again, that, that neighborhood is pretty much uh, the neighborhood that prompted me to be concerned and trying to get it uh, accelerated. That neighborhood has pretty much been demolished as it is. So I think it takes, you know, now we have the time, and let's, let's, do, let's get it right. I think it's an excellent idea, and I, I will say, as, as the ordinance has written, I could not vote in favor of it. If, it. if it comes up in two weeks like it is now, I still can't vote in favor of it. So we do need to meet and get some something that everybody can agree to. So we will we will try to set up some meetings and uh, with the appropriate parties and see if we can do that within two weeks. If we can't, then possibly the, the council will table it for more time. Great, thank you. Item uh, 9A2 is a request for approval of amendments to the Auburn Zoning Ordinance to require that if the PDD expires, the base zone that re the base zone will revert to its prior base zone if the base zone was rezoned in conjunction with the PDD designation. Uh, the Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this item. A public hearing is required. All right, at this time, I'll open the public hearing. If anybody would like to come forward and speak to this item, please do so at this time. We'll give a minute. All right. Any anybody like to speak to this item before we close the public hearing? All right. I'll close the public hearing. I'd like to introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. <clears throat> Anyone have an issue with moving forward with this agenda item for this evening? All right. Seeing none. Lindsay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Item 9B is Parker Ross requesting to apply a PDD designation to 30.62 acres zone CDD on property located at the south corner of East Sanford Avenue and East Glen Avenue. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this item and a public hearing is required. Okay, at this time I'll open the public hearing for this item. Anybody wish to come forward and speak to this issue? All right, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. All right, anyone have an issue with moving forward with this item this evening? All right, seeing none, Lindsay? Dixon? Yes. Griswold? Yes. Hody? Yes, ma'am. Barson? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Item 9C1 is Michael and Holly Bolton requesting annexation of 0.94 acres located at 4400 Lee Road 146, which is Moore's Mill Road. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this item. Does not have a public hearing. So. This does not have a public hearing. Right. Anyone wish to introduce the ordinance? I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. I will second it. All right. Anyone have an, um, any concerns with moving forward with this item this evening? All right. Say none, Lindsay. Griswold? Yes. Hobie? Yes, ma'am. Barson? Yes. Smith? Yes, ma'am. Taylor? Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Dixon? Yes. Item 9C2 is Justin Clark requesting annexation of 8.5 acres located at the southwest corner of Sand Hill Road and Lee Road 26. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this item. There is no public hearing. End use ordinance ask unanimous consent. Second. All right. Anyone have an issue with moving forward with this item this evening? 
Say it none, Lindsay. Yes, ma'am. Carson? Yes. Smith? Yes, ma'am. Taylor? Yes. Whitney? Yes. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Dixon? Yes. Griswold? Yes. Under resolutions this evening, we have item 10A as Parker Ross requesting conditional use approval for multiple uses for a property located at the south corner of East Sanford Avenue and East Glen Avenue. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this item and a public hearing is required. I don't open the public hearing if anybody would like to come forward and speak to this item. All right, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. For approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Anybody um, have anything they'd like to discuss regarding this item? And Jim, this is also in relation to um, an item that we've already... It was in, in relation to the ordinance, yes. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Item, <clears throat> item 10B1 authorizes the fixing of costs for cutting of grass and weeds at 556 Foster Street. A public hearing is required. I don't open the public hearing. If anybody would like to come forward and speak to this item, please do so at this time. All right, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? No. I, I, no. And I missed this on Friday because I was going to ask about this now. Is this, what is this actually saying here? What is MTAG? They cut the grass on 556 Foster oh, Street. The weeds and the grass had grown to a, a point where it becomes a health and safety issue. We try to contact the owner of the property. Uh, we send letters, we send certified letters, we do everything we can to contact the owner to have the owner cut the grass. If we can't do that, then what we do is we go out and cut the grass and the weeds and then when you approve this, that puts a lien on the property. If that owner ever sells the property, they have to pay us for us going out and cutting the grass and the weeds. So is this every time or is this just for just this time? This is just for this time. And MTAG is the entity name, correct? I think that's what I'm sorry? MTAG is the entity name? That's yes. The, yeah. Yes. Okay, I was just trying to understand it. Okay, anyone else? We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Item 10B2 authorizes the fixing of costs for cutting of grass and weeds at 325 Holly Tree Lane. A public hearing is required. Yeah. <coughs> Open the public hearing if anybody would like to come forward and speak to this item. All right, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Move to approve. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion regarding this item? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Those are all the items we have on the agenda this evening. All right, we do have other business. I'd like to quickly just mention, I um, uh, did not mention this early on, that we had a successful day of Board of Education interviews, and several of us were there, and we're still in the process of deliberating um, on our individual um, thoughts on that, and then we'll come together on March the 5th to make that nomination. But I want to say thank you to all the 21 who applied for the position and also the seven who came and interviewed. I thought we had an um, credible slate of candidates, and we should be very proud with the individuals who came forward and, and interviewed. And then um, he snuck out, but we had Senator Watley here, and I was going to um, recognize him as well. And at this time, um, is there any other business before we move to citizens forum? Did you mention? Did you want to mention that one of them with you, or did you say it? Oh, I did not say that. Um, yes, we did have one candidate that withdrew, and so that um, leaves six candidates for us to um, deliberate over. Great. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. All right. At this time, we'll um, open citizens' open forum. At this time, you'll have three minutes to come and discuss any um, anything that is on your mind. All right, we have a quiet. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Paula Green. I live at 751 Heard Avenue. 
Um, I came here tonight, I lived here seven years and um, never come to a council member meeting. Um, I should have earlier than tonight. Um, it's a little intimidating being up here. Uh, and I know nothing about the issues that were discussed in the public hearing and the RDD and what's going on, but um, I wanted to make some sort of global comments. Um, and that discussion tonight has sort of, um, uh, well, it was enlightening to say the least, but it, it underscores some of my issues. And first of all, um, Mr. Parsons, I want to uh, just say I agree with everything you said tonight with regard to that. I think that the residents that already live in this town are being forgotten. If they're not being forgotten, they sure there's a perception out there that they are being forgotten, that we are or you are beholden to the developers and uh, the speculators and the investors in this town. And I realize they're here to make money. And yeah, I get that. That That is, you know, that's what they're there to do. It's not to improve the communities. It's there to make money. So keep that in mind. And uh, yes, I know there's property rights out there and I'm well versed in them as an attorney, but you are elected officials that are there to look out for us as well. Um, I am glad that there's this new inclusion and diversity uh, subcommittee that you guys are looking into. I hope that it works out and might be too little too late, but I hope you do get some more people to be represented before you and you hear their views. Um, a couple of just small issues. Um, Mr. Northcutt, when he, when he ran, I know that he said that one thing he was going to look into is infrastructure, and I do think that the, sometimes the infrastructure in this town, you're forgetting about the old established neighborhoods. I live on Hurd Avenue. Ever since they put in the Moores Mill uh, new intersection, um, my road between uh, 7 and 7.30 in the morning is like the New Jersey Turnpike. I cannot walk my dogs on that because the traffic patterns have changed. I don't know if you guys look into that when you make these changes, um, but these little small changes have big impacts on the neighborhood. Another thing is just land use. I'd like to say I heard a lot of people um, talk about wanting to see more open space. Um, I don't see any more open space going in. Putting in soccer fields at Town Creek Park, that's not the answer. I'd like to see as we Subdivide, subdivide, build, build. Please set some land aside. Just undeveloped land. People really want it here. So uh, that's it. Thank you. All right, anyone else? If I could just speak to that issue that you're talking about, the traffic. Um, I'm not sure in heard whether you're in five or six, but if you contact your, your yeah, if you contact him, we can address it with the city staff. Yes, sir. L.B. Jackson, once again. Uh, I am, uh, have, we're having some very, very deep concerns. Uh, this is in an RDD area, the 18 acres of the Cadino property. Um, but first, I'd like to thank you guys for having met with uh, the, the mayor, which, you know, we, I worked on the Richmond Road intersection with the previous council and I met with Mr. Griswold, Councilman Taylor, and, and a couple of other people uh, as it pertains to that particular intersection that intersects Richmond Road. I think we're finally getting somewhere, and I, I'm really, really appreciative of that uh, from this council because in the past I got very little response, and I hope when this does come up for some additional improvements outside of the present day contract that's under construction. I, I hope that you guys will vote to unanimously uh, do what's right about that particular intersection. I'd like to thank you for that. But my real concerns tonight is the Cardino property, RDD, its zone. Uh, I understand that there has to be a phase one assessment done of the property. I'm here to encourage you guys because of uh, my findings to ask for not only a phase one but a phase two based upon the fact that there has been a 30 foot infilling of that particular property. I know normally you just ask for phase one but because we know in the community that there has been an in infilling and we know that doing the 70s and the late 60s 
that there was any regulations outside of the environmental department, which is the health department, to regulate what went in that there. But traditionally, I hate to keep just talking about Northwest Auburn problems, but traditionally in Northwest Auburn, the soccer field on Sugar Jordan Parkway, it's on top of a landfill there. The Pleasant Avenue property is a part of that. It's on the top of a landfill. Four landfills or, or properties in Northwest Auburn has been used for infilling and landfills. The only property, I'm three out of four, the only property that is a brownfield right now is the airport. And it was developed with regulations from the EPA. I urge you guys, because you do have the power, to ask for not only a phase one, but a phase two. Sure, it's cleared stormwater. But if you look at the topography of the property, there is an infilling of 30 feet. And all indications indicate that, that we don't know what's underneath there. And if you guys vote that, proper, if the planning commission broke that property to be used for residential use, it would be a sad day in Auburn, Alabama, if we start finding out that like it is with service stations and other uh, developments, that there's leakage, there's bad soils, and some kid, the whole community gets uh, in an uproar behind all of that, and it would be a bad thing, not just for Northwest Auburn, but for the city as a whole. So I'm gonna urge you guys to ask not only for a phase one, because it's such superficial uh, examination, to ask for a phase, ask the Planning Commission to ask the engineering to give us a phase two, which is some drilling that needs to be done to identify what's there. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for Citizens Open Forum? All right. Um, do we have, that's I think all that we have in front of us this evening. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. Second? Second. All right. Thank y'all. Thank you.